I'm all prepared. Have my slides start. Wow. CD much? By the way, your timer's on. Oh, I don't trust that thing. I have. <laughs> That's cool. It's because I go forwards and backs, backwards and it, and it resets the clock. And so there's no way to fix it. I said use a man, manual stopwatch. So I'm going to introduce Bobby and then I'm going to... Do, do you want, so I'm, I'm going to introduce him, then this, then you. And then after, do, you, do, we, do I say reception's in 45 minutes or... Do, um, do yeah, sure, I can come up and do that. Yeah. Okay, so um, we're going to get started. Amusingly enough, the uh, keynote is not at 9 in the morning. The reason the keynote is not at 9 in the morning is some of us don't really believe in 9 in the morning. But I was actually here at 7.30. So, uh, um, but before we get started, I'd like to introduce the CEO of ACM, Bobby Schnabel, who wants to make a few comments, and then I'll make a few comments, and then we'll get started. We're a diverse organization. I do believe in nine in the morning. Um, so I really only wanted to say two things. Um, one is on behalf of ACM, which is hosting this conference, to uh, both welcome you and thank you very much for coming. And the other is that somewhere around 8.30 in the morning, Terry Cota, who's another one of the co-organizers, mentioned that uh, already two people had asked how they could get more involved with ACM. Well, I figured if two people had said that by 8.30, by now maybe 50 people have said that. So whatever the number is, I will certainly be here and at the reception. If there's anybody who would like to chat about that or anything else, I just welcome you to, uh, to chat during the reception. So thanks again. Thanks. So I just wanted to make a few brief comments about the conference. Since this is the keynote, this means theoretically we're all going to be in the same room. Um, this is the second uh, applicative conference. A brief show of hands, how many people were here last year? Oh, great. That's, I'm glad we're getting return visitors. I'm also mildly blinded, but I think I saw some hands go up. Uh, so this is the second applicative conference. Uh, myself, Terry Cota, Sammy Albara, who is somewhere in the audience, uh, and the folks at ACM and the practitioner board of ACM, of which I am the current head, uh, you know, wanted to have a conference that was both for uh, the academic side of the, of the house as well as the practitioner and developer side of the house. And that's what applicative is for. It's to bring together the best of both worlds so that both sides can see what the other side is doing. Um, so very briefly, that's why we do applicative. Um, we are planning to do an applicative 2017, which will be planned after we all recover from having finished applicative 2016. So uh, without further ado, I wanted to introduce uh, Brendan Gregg, who's currently at Netflix, uh, does some really amazing work on performance and systems measurement, and he's going to talk about system methodology. I could have read that off his slide. Um, please welcome Brendan, and thank you very much. Good day, I'm Brendan, and thanks, George, for that introduction. It's 1969, and the Apollo 11 lunar module is descending to make the first manned lunar landing. Five minutes into the descent, and at 6,000 feet above the surface, there is a 1202 program alarm. This is actually a performance issue. This is a problem. It could mean an abort for the landing. Neil Armstrong later said, we didn't want to practice an abort. Fortunately, an engineer had seen this before and was able to give the go to continue. What if I asked you Analyze the performance of the Apollo guidance computer. Where would you start? How would you proceed through steps to get to root cause? You can't look this up online. And this is quite similar to how performance engineering works, especially for new systems and new applications. When I'm doing performance analysis of a new application Netflix has developed, I can't search for the answers online. I need to figure it out to start with. And that means I need a starting point for my analysis. Something that works very well is to begin with a functional diagram and then to apply methodologies. And this is how I approach that unfamiliar system. A functional diagram can look like this. 
This one is actually the Apollo Lunar Module Guidance Computer Functional Diagram. I found this in the abundance of Apollo documentation online. It's amazing what's online these days. This one's almost perfect. I did add a few sections for the storage. So I've added the corset area and VAC sets, which are registers that the, the kernel or executive program used. There is erasable memory, which is two killer words of read-write core memory. And there's also fixed memory, which is 36 killer words of core rope, rope memory, which is read-only, and that contained the program and instruction code. Given a functional diagram like this, we can then apply methodologies, and that's the starting point. A methodology I like to use is called the use method, and it's pretty easy to explain. I'll go through it. With the use method, you take a functional diagram that shows the resources, and then for each component, you look for three metrics, which is utilization, saturation, and errors. It may not work for all the components, but it gives you something to do, and it has been quite effective in, in starting with that unfamiliar system and making forward progress and making headway. So this is like a computer diagram where you have a CPU and memory and disks and network, except many of the peripherals here are hardware on the spacecraft. But I can take things like the gimbal drive actuators, and I could look at utilization of them, how often they were being used. I can look at any error signals from them. I can look at saturation. Perhaps we were sending too many gimbal commands, and they're in a saturated state. I could go to the rendezvous radar and the coupling data unit, go through the same exercise and try and come up with metrics. The easiest one to talk about is the CPU itself, the, L the Lunar Module Guidance Computer. And it was actually a, a, an advanced system. It was ahead of its time. Even though it didn't have much memory, it was a multitasked machine. And the kernel, which at the time was called the executive program, was able to run several jobs concurrently. So here's our sophisticated CPU, and we want three metrics, utilization, saturation, and errors. CPU utilization is something we're all familiar with today. And at the time, as far as I can tell, they were also quite familiar with this, and sometimes called it CPU load, but were able to state the percentage of cycles that were in use for running different programs. During the lunar descent, they expected the guidance computer to be running at a CPU load of 85%. When the executive program wasn't running a job, it would run a dummy job. And so calculating this metric was a matter of figuring out how many cycles were not running the dummy job. So how many cycles were actually doing jobs. That's, that's good, so we have our utilization metric. How many cycles are not in the dummy job? What about saturation? Nowadays, for saturation for CPUs, we want to look at the run queue length. So very high load averages is another way to measure that, where you have threads that are waiting their turn on CPU. This was a concurrent system as well. And when the CPU had more jobs than it could dispatch, the executive program, I just like saying that, moved the jobs to the core set area, which was a set of uh, several sets of registers that could take on a, a job in, in, a, in a form, it's a hardware form of a run queue. So if we measure the, the corset area and how much that was utilized, we actually have a saturation metric. So I, for the third metric for the use method, that's errors. And there are various error states for the guidance computer. One of them that comes from the saturation metric is what happens when you run out of core sets. So on modern systems, we can just keep increasing the run queue. We can keep, we can keep creating threads and jobs, and we're just bounded by main memory. But here we're bounded by this resource, the core set area. What happened when the core set area became saturated, you're trying to do too much CPU work, is a program error. And that program error was the 1202 program alarm. Now that we think about it in those terms, it actually sounds much, much, uh, a, a much more familiar problem. The Apollo Lunar Module guidance computer had a CPU alert 
that fired during the descent. And it wasn't something that they had uh, simulated that often. And this was something that kept Neil Armstrong's attention during the landing, so he was focusing more attention on the inside of the spacecraft than the outside of the spacecraft, and lost his bearings a little bit during the final touchdown. That's pretty interesting. I can also quickly go through a different methodology with this functional diagram, and that's workload analysis. With workload analysis, you look at the load applied to the components. And so if I was to look at the load applied to the CPU, on modern systems, you can usually get a process listing and find out what, who, is, who is asking, who is doing cycles of work on the CPU. For the guidance computer, there are many sources of interrupts, and those interrupts can then spawn jobs. So maybe a, a sensor has read some data and is scheduling a job to process that data. The rendezvous radar is sending data and creating interrupts on the guidance computer. And so to do a workload characterization of who's using that computer, you would find during the descent, the rendezvous radar was consuming 13 to 15% of CPU cycles, not doing anything terribly useful. The rendezvous radar was pointed up, not down, and it was pointed at the command module to keep track of that so that if they aborted the landing, they could automatically go back and rendezvous. And it was consuming extra CPU cycles. It was actually due to a peripheral error, uh, which was synchronizing the signal with the computer, and it was creating unnecessary work. That's actually what overloaded the CPU and created the 1202 alarm, but something that could show up with, uh, with workload characterization. Uh, th there's also VAC sets, which to complete the story, later on during the landing, there was a 1201 alarm instead of 1202. VAC sets is very similar to core sets. That's for vector accumulator, and uh, there were five of them for more sophisticated jobs to store various numbers. So I work at Netflix, and unfortunately I don't work on the Apollo program because that sounds pretty exciting, but I do work on other really exciting things. We are deployed in most countries in the world. We have customers everywhere. The cloud for Netflix is Ubuntu, and we have a CDN, which is FreeBSD. Now, for background about methodologies, I'd like to talk about history, where, where this is coming from. Systems performance analysis up to the 90s was about closed-sourced operating systems and applications. The vendors would create metrics and create performance tools, and it was up to you to interpret them and figure out performance. With various problems, in fact, I've got uh, the output of PSALX. This is actually from Unix 7th uh, edition, in case that looked terribly familiar. It's been looking like that for a long time. It was your job to figure out the performance issues based on what you had. There was quite a lot of effort required to infer system behavior rather than to measure directly. And people like myself got very good at this, and uh, that's, that's what you did as a performance engineer. You were, you were outstanding at being able to run VMstat and ISstat and those tools and then infer what the kernel was doing without being able to see it directly. And so that was the job. Given metrics, what can we do with them? Lots of blind spots. Also, vendors may not give you the best metrics in the first place. And so it's a myth to think that since the vendor created the operating system or application, they must be the smartest engineers and developers to create the metrics for us to consume. And sometimes that's true because they understand it thoroughly, but sometimes you're using it in different ways they didn't anticipate, or sometimes they've rolled out features too quickly and instrumentation has lagged behind. There's lots and lots of reasons why you're using a product that does not have good instrumentation. But you were stuck with that in the past. Today, things are quite different. We have an expectation of open source. So operating systems like Linux, BSDs, applications are also, there's an, a, a big expectation for open source. Of course, there's some exceptions. What this means is if I'm looking at an application or an operating system and I really want some metrics, I now have options. I can go and browse the source code I can come up with my own patch. I could compile it as a proof of concept. 
And then I could propose it get, gets integrated in, into the operating system or application. There's also dynamic tracing nowadays. It helps a lot if the, the target of dynamic tracing is open source. But with dynamic tracing, I can create my own metrics on the fly. In fact, sometimes that can be a step before writing a patch. So you can prototype with dynamic tracing, see how valuable the metrics are, then actually do the effort to patch it in properly. Since we now have the freedom to ask que the questions we want, we don't need to spend so much effort inferring system behavior. We can directly measure it. So this has really opened the door to doing methodologies where we can start with the, the actual questions we want answered and then go and create the metrics to answer them. Methodologies are particularly useful because they can help pose the questions. I was quite involved with Dtrace when Sun launched that, getting customers to use it, creating tools. And the biggest problem I saw with, with Dtrace and with dynamic tracing, which was an awesome tool, but the biggest problem was customers did not know what to do with it. You had this magical superpower of reading any kernel state going inside software and instructions. And customers were unfamiliar with having that freedom. So we're in the age of crystal ball thinking, where instead of consuming what the vendor gives you and figuring out what can I do given what I've, what I've been given by the vendor, we need to think, we can answer anything. We can ask any question of the system. What's the most efficient series of questions we can ask to root cause performance to give us a starting point? And these can be, become methodologies. I'll start by talking about anti-methodologies. The streetlight anti-method. This is named after a parable about a drunk who's looking for his keys under a streetlight. And a police officer asks, did you lose your keys under the streetlight? And the drunk says, no, but that's where the light is best. In computing, I often see people using top or SNMP metrics or TCP dump when it's not really suitable to use those tools, but those are the tools that they're most familiar with. They're familiar, they're found on the internet, or they found at random, and they're looking for obvious issues. Uh, the problem with, this, with it is it's quite time consuming, and you can miss lots of issues. Another anti-methodology would be the drunk man anti-method. And the first one was an observational methodology. This would be experimental. And this is where you tune things at random until the problem goes away. Or maybe you drink things at random until the problem goes away, <laughs> until you don't care about the problem. Uh, it's actually been useful to give this a name because I got to work one day and my engineers a long time ago said, Brendan, we tuned the system last night because we had an emergency and we used the drunk man anti-method, just so you know. And so it was my job to then figure out what side effects the crazy tunables they had picked had. It was handy to give that a name. Another anti-methodology I see is the blame someone else anti-method instead of analyzing a system. You find a system or environment component you are not responsible for and you say the problem must be with that. I see this all the time for blaming the network. It's always the network. There's gotta be some network latencies between us and the, this is such an arduous exercise. It'll take them weeks before they come back to you and talk to the network team and talk to the ISPs and providers. So, but this is an anti-methodology. Another anti-methodology I'd call the traffic light anti-method. And that's where you think, wouldn't it be great if everything was traffic lights? If I could have a dashboard where everything was just green. So let's turn all our metrics into traffic lights. Then we open the dashboard. If everything is green, we're good. We don't have to analyze any, any more. Now there's two types of errors there. That's red instead of green, where you're wasting time with a false negative, or green instead of red. So that's a false positive, and you and not diagnosing a real issue because it's saying it's green when it should be red, and you're wasting time looking elsewhere. Traffic lights are okay for objective metrics, say errors. So if there's an error, it's an error, if it's a disk error. Uh, that, that's not open to interpretation. So you can have a, you can have a, a red and green for errors, but for subjective met metrics like IOPS and latency, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. <laughs> 
You may be able to put a traffic light on, I have not met my SLA for latency, and that might be fine. But to just say 100 IOPS is green and 1,000 IOPS is red, that, that just doesn't make any sense. That could be the other way around. Now for some real methodologies. And there are lots of methodologies we can apply to systems. So there's not just one, there's not just the use method. And think of it as building up your own toolbox of methodologies. For systems engineers, this is a way to analyze that unfamiliar system or application. If you're an app developer, this can help you choose what metrics to include and to choose what metrics to put on the, put on the dashboard to support methodologies. The first one is really worth including the problem statement method. And this comes from enterprise perform, I, mean, I, I, I took this from enterprise performance analysis, which had multiple tiers of escalation for performance issues. And early on, they would get a customer on the phone and go through a series of, of questions to figure out if the performance issue was real or not. And they were able to do this over the phone and an analyze and solve lots and lots of performance issues without even logging into the box. And so what makes you think there is a performance problem? And sometimes it, it, the, the answer to that doesn't make any sense. Has the system ever performed well? Uh, one time I was asked to analyze database performance and I jumped onto the box and had a look and disks were crazy. The IOPS were through the roof, latency was terrible. I'm looking, I'm, wow, this, this system's melting down. I look at the summary since boot, it's been like that since the thing's booted. It's like, oh, well, so <laughs> what happened? Maybe they upgraded the operating system and maybe they re somehow there's less DRAM to cache the file system. So I'm trying to rev go back in time and do forensics of what changed. And I just couldn't figure it out. And the system had been around for like three weeks. And so after a day banging my head against the wall, I asked the, the database administrators who asked me to work on it, what changed? Like, has the system ever performed well? Because I can't find it. And they said, oh, no, it's never performed well. It's always been like that. So that information would have been really useful to know. So when they first set it up, it had always been on fire. <laughs> they just decided to wait three weeks and then file a ticket and say, hey, fix this now. <laughs> it's melting down. It's been melting down since you, since you created it. It's always been in this state. What has changed recently? Software, hardware, or load? Really important. Can the problem be described in terms of latency or runtime? So not in terms of IOPS or throughput. Uh, it, it doesn't matter if your disks are doing 10,000 IOPS. It's, it can be so, so asynchronous to the application, it's not really a, it's not a primary indicator of a, of a performance issue. Application latency is a primary indicator of, of a performance issue, and that's why we try and focus on that. Does the problem affect other people or applications? Just a quick way to narrow it down. So maybe there's a net, there is a network issue or something that's isolated, and what is the environment? And I've had many of these where uh, I'm told, fix this system, and you just start asking, how many disks does the system have? How are they configured? How many CPUs do you have? And then you quickly realize, this workload is, is not really going to work on that system. It's a, it's a really underperforming system, and you're trying to run a massive, massive workload on it. So very useful, can be done over the phone. Another methodology I would call the functional diagram method, and you got a taste of it at the start where I, where I went through the Apollo Lunar Module Guidance Computer. That's where you draw the functional diagram, you trace all the components in the data path, and then for each component in the data path, you check its performance. It breaks a bigger problem up into smaller relevant parts that are touching the data. I have a diagram there of the internet uh, from 1969 during the Apollo lunar landing. And you can imagine if I was at uh, Utah on the PDP-10 and I had a performance issue connecting to the 360 at UCSB, then by having the functional diagram, I know that, well, I've got two systems and three routers. I don't need to worry about the other ones. And now I've got five tasks to go, to go and analyze one by one. And so it's given me a starting point to go and do. Pretty simple. Workload analysis. It's worth talking about this as a 
performance methodology. And this is, it's, it's related to drill down methodologies where you're starting with the workload in application context and then we're drilling down into the system until we get to the root cause. So I may have an application request. I know the latency, I'm, I'm focusing on outliers. I then look at what system library calls is this application request making. Actually, I can start with the internals. There may be internal layers within the application, uh, logical blocks that it's calling during the request, then getting into system libraries and system calls, then getting into the kernel, file systems and networking, and then going all the way down into hardware. It's great when you're able to measure latency as you drill down because you're doing it in application context. It's too easy just to go to the kernel and start looking at disk latency and network issues, but you don't have application context. You don't know if it's asynchronous or if it's affecting the customers. By drilling down, you carry that context with you, hopefully, if you can do it. That sounds great. The problem is it is difficult to dig from the application all the way down to the resource. You're hopping through lots of layers. And even with a sophisticated dynamic tracer, it's still a lot of, lot of work. Maybe worth it. Another problem with this methodology is how it actually works is application specific. So if I did workload analysis for a Cassandra database, and then I was doing it for a Node.js application server or Apache Tomcat, then there's, there's all different steps. So it's, it's something that, would, that has to be rethought each time. Another form of workload analysis, and this I'd call its own methodology, is workload characterization. This has been known for a long, long time. And I've seen it documented in books as far back as Raj Jain. And this is where we're looking at who, why, what, and how. We want to look at the workload that's applied to a target, but not the performance of the target. So don't worry about the latency. Don't worry about, about how slow the target is responding. Just look at the workload to see if it makes sense or if the workload is ridiculous. So, for example, for CPUs, to step through this, who would be what programs are running? What users are, are doing this? Why would be what code paths? Why is a CPU? I, I know that it's Apache Tomcat, but why is Apache Tomcat on CPU? Do a, you, do a CPU profile so I can see the code paths that are executing. What is the CPU actually doing? So CPU instructions, cycles, stall cycles. And then how is it changing over time? I can do this for any target. I can do this for, for disks. So who's using disks? It's a bit trickier, still can be done. Code paths that are, that are getting to the disks, that's pretty useful too. Uh, you may find that there's, there's the synchronous I.O., the application's doing it, but then there's a, whole, there's a whole heap of asynchronous I.O. There can be read ahead or, or, or write back flushing, uh, resilvering, all sorts of other kernel originating I.O. requests that you don't see normally if you're just thinking about applications. So code paths, excellent. What is the, is the disks doing? You might want to break that down into I.O.P. type, so read write, size, disk offset, so you can check for random versus sequential. You may want to go down to SCSI commands, if it's doing disk flushes, trim commands, and then how is that changing over time? And you can go higher up as well, not just devices, but I may do workload characterization for an application server to see the request type, who is using the application server, which IP addresses, uh, why are they using it, what, what request types are they doing, give me some breakdowns there, and so on. For CPU in particular, I've got this diagram to show ideally what I, what I would see. Here's who, why, how, and what. And the who and the, the how is something that's pretty commonly measured. So I've got the, the screenshot of HTOP. Uh, but the why and the what is less commonly measured. So doing a CPU profile, that might be flame graphs. And then the what, it's using CPU performance monitoring counters to find out exactly the cycles and their breakdown. So that's workload characterization. Resource analysis is the opposite, that's going bottom up. And with resource analysis, this is something that has typically been done in systems perform performance for a long time. Uh, some of the oldest books on systems performance do performance by 
you have the CPU chapter, the disks chapter, the network chapter. I'm guilty of writing those books as well. It's, it's a simple approach to break apart the problem. And we can move from bottom up. So we can start by analyzing the hardware and then trying to see if it's a problem or not and then see if it's a problem for the application and work our way up to application context. A nice thing about it is it's generic so that if you get good at analyzing disks and networks and TCP IP, it works for all applications. It also aids resource performance tuning once you begin down there and you understand them. A problem with this is you do get uneven coverage going from bottom up as some issues may originate in other layers or in, in the application. You, but you can also get a lot of false positives. By the time we're actually using resources, there's usually many layers in the kernel have tried to be clever and do things asynchronously. So like non-block, not just non-blocking I.O., but we've been, been doing things like that in the kernel for years. So that's, that's where file systems do read ahead or write back. We're, we're going to dirty memory and then flush it later. So you may look at the disks and they have very high latency, but no one's suffering that latency. So it can be misleading. The use method. I began by talking about the use method. This is another uh, resource analysis methodology. And I began by talking about this. It's very simple. It's find a functional diagram, and then for each resource, utilization, saturation, and errors. It's great because it starts with the questions. And this is what's opposite from the historical way of doing performance analysis, where we take what the vendors give us and then try and interpret it. Now we can create our own checklist. For CPUs, in fact, I've got the functional diagram here. For CPUs, I want those three fine. For memory, fine. CPU interconnect, I want utilization, saturation, and errors for the interconnect. That's a resource as well, and you can saturate it, and I have saturated it in the past. Mem same for the memory bus, same for everything. Same for everything that's in the data path. You want those three metrics. I have taken a swing at this for different operating systems, and I've put that on my homepage. It's a Rosetta Stone of performance checklists. And it's very long, so the whole thing doesn't fit on the slide. But going through the different resources, like CPUs, interconnects, memory, memory interconnects, and so on and so on, the three different metrics, and then how you measure it for the different operating systems. I also did it for Unix 7th edition, just for fun, see if it would work. Getting into things like uh, disk IO, tape IO, <laughs> look at tape drives and watch them spin. I wonder if I just, I saw that when I put the slides together, I wonder if I, I just didn't miss the metric or if that was really it. I was, really, I was digging through the source code and if, if I couldn't uh, find a metric, I was coming up with some creative solutions. And of course the uh, Apollo guidance computer, which I began by talking about, which is fascinating. Now, the use method doesn't work for all of the boxes, but uh, it does give you a starting point. Some of the metrics may not work, but it gives you that uh, approach. Also works for software. So for software resources, that can be kernel internals or application internals. It can be your entire environment. You can apply this at a small scale for things like locks. You consider a lock as a resource or a file descriptor as a resource, or large scale, apps, databases. So I've got mutex locks here just as an example. For a mutex lock, Utilization could be uh, the lock hold time. So during a second, how, what's the percentage, percentage of time that lock was held? That's really interesting to track because if it gets to 100%, it means someone's always holding that lock. And it mean, if I'm trying to run things in parallel, it's not going to work because 100% of the time there is a, a holder of the lock. That would actually be a good metric to measure and I do try to measure it with some of my custom tools. The off-the-shelf tools for lock analysis that I've tended to use don't express it that way. They'll give you histograms of lock hold time, but not as that utilization percentage. I'm not saying that mine's better than theirs. It's all different ways to ultimately solve the same problem. Uh, saturation for locks, so lock contention. Uh, that's very well understood. And that's where you can measure time that other threads are waiting to hold that lock uh, when, the, when, they're in, when they're trying to grab it. Errors, any errors you have for mutex locks, which is a bit strange. Maybe there's uh, recursive mutex trying to grab it recursively. That could be an error. 
if we try to scale this up to an entire application, so utilization can be the, maybe it's percentage of worker threads that were busy each second. So you can see when that's reaching 100%. Saturation could be the length of queued work that you haven't dispatched, another very useful metric to track. And then errors for any request errors. Often, using the use method in practice, saturation is, is one of the best performance metrics because it ends up being linear. It has a linear relationship with the performance pain of the application. It usually is related to wait time. Utilization, not so much. So if CPUs are at 50% utilized or 80% utilized, it, it, it may or may not make a big deal. Uh, but if the run queue, the average run queue latency for CPUs goes from 10 milliseconds to 100 milliseconds, that's something that all the applications are going to suffer. And that's just added onto request latency. So saturation can often be a better signal of a performance issue as it's wasted time. It's just time blocked waiting. There's another methodology called the red method, which I think was inspired by the use method, and that's going at a higher level as well. And for the red method, for every service, again, back to the functional diagrams, we want the request rate, error rate, and then the duration or latency as a, as a distribution to study it and to check that they're all within our SLA. It's, it's another useful exercise and gives you another starting point. So you can imagine having whatever your uh, architectural diagram is, and then stepping through it and making sure you can measure those three. Thread state analysis is a, another methodology. This time it's, I do have a state transition diagram, but this time it's different. It's not a functional diagram. This time I'm showing how threads are changing state. I've drawn this one, this is an ideal one. Thre state the state transition diagram actually uh, I originally got this from uh, the Bark Unix book, which had the process lifecycle, and that was from the 80s. Here I've drawn an ideal thread state analysis, uh, thread state transition diagram, so you can see when threads are on CPU, and we're mode switching between user and kernel, or when we're off CPU and we're in all the other states. So you may be runnable, but you're waiting your turn, swapping out, blocking on I.O., and so on. If I can identify where my applications are in each of the states and then quantify how long they're in those states, that gives me a great starting point for performance analysis. If I found out I'm spending 90% of my time in the runnable state, I know I'm CPU saturated. I can also do estimated speed up, 10x, if I can fix that. So it's a great way to narrow the further analysis to, to tools that are related to that state. Another benefit of this is thread states are applicable to all applications. So once you, look, once you get good at this on your operating system, you can take on anything. Now, I said this is my ideal diagram. I have not seen an operating system that does it this nicely. Solaris got pretty close. It grouped a bit too much into the sleep state. So I drew this as a, as a, a checklist for stepping through thread state analysis methodology. Solaris came with a tool, PRStat. You could run PRStat minus MLC, which used microstate accounting, and broke the threads into states, user system, data faults, locks, sleep times, and CPU latency as well. And then, based on the state, you could then follow my analysis steps and then take resulting actions. This worked really well. I've solved, when, when I worked on Solaris, I solved lots and lots of issues using this methodology. So breaking up each of the application threads times into those states to direct further analysis. Now, thread states have been around for a while. Solaris helped refine them and did microstate accounting, which, which helped. But just as an example of, of them from other operating systems, this one is from Ristus, the DEC operating system from the 70s. And it had a good idea of thread states. So everything down to uh, the job is waiting for the deck tape I.O., job is waiting for line printer, for, uh, disk I.O., that's a useful state. That's what I'm after. So lots of states there. So as a performance uh, engineer or analyst, 
this is what I'd be looking for. Now I want times in each of those for my jobs. Uh, 10x, which predates that even further, had if you did control T on a job, it would print out some rudimentary job states. This is another example. This is uh, Mac OS X instruments, and it plots threads over time, and it has its own thread states. Awesome stuff. Now, to get into the states in a bit more detail, so in my diagram, I had the on CPU states, and we can do on CPU analysis. I like CPU issues. CPU issues are usually the easiest ones. We don't have blocking and locks and, and, also, and sequences involved. You just have CPUs. It's great. So split the CPU time into user and kernel, useful exercise to find out what type of CPU cycles it is uh, or the nature. Check the CPU balance, another useful step. And that's where on, on Unixes you'd be running something like MPStat, and we want to know if maybe there's a single CPU that's running at 100%, that's flatlining, because there is a single threaded application that should be multi-threaded. Uh, there's so many CPUs these days, MPStat fills the screen and scrolls and scrolls. And if you, if you try and plot it as a line graph, you end up with paint because there's too many lines for the CPUs. So I'd recommend using CPU utilization heat maps, where on the y-axis it's percent utilization, the x-axis is time, and then the color saturation is how many CPUs fell into that time and utilization range. And that scales infinitely. You can do the, I've done that for 3,000 CPUs. So here, this shows that CPUs are grouped around 50%. No one's at the top, which is good, so there's no saturation. Uh, profiling software. User and kernel stack sampling. CPU flame graph is a great way to do that. And then to, to understand the CPU cycles, that's getting into P, PMCs, performance monitoring counters. So you can see what's happening with the caches and buses and stall cycles. CPU flame graph analysis, it's almost a methodology that we're doing all the time at Netflix. That's where it's, you take a CPU profile, you render it as a flame graph, and then you understand all software that is more than 1%. Now, some of this is obvious. So if I have this, this nice visualization, which is actually in uh, June communications of the ACM, I've got the canonical article about these called the flame graph. It's actually a pretty simple visualization. It's a uh, hierarchical diagram uh, using the icicle layout. And it groups code paths together really well. I throw out the passage of time. So I just want to group them so that you can see where the bulk of the samples are. Now, if you look for any of these towers that are wider than, than 1% with this relative to presence in the profile, so you literally look for the biggest things, it will directly tell me CPU consumers. But you can also see, in practice, we see a lot of indirect performance issues as well. If you're doing a lot of disk I.O., you're blocking. So you're not going to be present in the CPU profile. Ah, but you will be present a little bit because you do have to go through the storage I.O. subsystem and you have to go through the file system. And often there is enough CPU cycles to show up more than 1%. If you see more than 1% in disk I.O. or network I.O. or some locking code path, that's where the CPU profile has indirectly identified an issue, and that gives you a clue for further analysis. Because you know performance is, so let's say it's a, a, a mutex lock code path, performance is at least this bad. It's, it's going to be a whole lot more bad when I include the off CPU time. So pretty useful. At Netflix, we use them for uh, Java, and we've got mixed mode flame graphs working. So on Linux, so you can see Java code, which I color green, and then kernel code, user code, C++ code. And also CPI flame graphs. Uh, this example I happened to do on FreeBSD using P PMC stat. A CPI flame graph takes a normal flame graph, but instead of coloring it randomly, like I did here, well, actually, no, I'm using hues to show the type. This time, I'm using the color to show the cycles per instruction, which is a very high-level metric for how efficient the CPU is operating. So red is where we're instruction bound and blue is stall cycle bound. Understanding the difference between this tells the developer to take a different 
methodology when tuning performance. If it's instruction bound, do less code. If it's stall cycle bound, then look at improving memory usage, reducing memory usage, doing zero copy and those things. So a very, uh, CPI is a very commonly studied metric for this kind of thing. So anyway, CPU analysis, I, I went through that quickly because it's, in some ways I feel it's a solved problem. Once you get stack traces to work to make flame graphs work, off CPU analysis is much harder. And that's where we, when we block and we're spending time off CPU. And that's all of these other virtual states that I've drawn. You can make an off CPU time flame graph. So here the X axis, instead of, for the CPU flame graph, the X axis is the population or samples. Now it's the time we were blocked. And then the frames show the path that we're blocked. So this one shows sysread, that's the tar command. Most of the time we're doing sysread, VFS read, uh, we're going into the storage IO subsystem. We're actually reading files because tar is archiving things. Sometimes we're going into ext4 and we're iterating over directories. Uh, sometimes we're doing fstats, path reads, and pipe writes. All of that blocking time is present. If you wanted to performance analyze tar, you just look for the biggest one, this one, with the the file reads from disk. That's what I need to improve the most. Now, off CPU flame graphs sounds like, with off CPU flame graphs and on CPU flame graphs, it sounds like we can solve every issue. It sounds like, like I can go home, like performance has been solved. It turns out it doesn't work that well in practice because often if you look at the blocking code path, you're blocking on a mutex lock for a long time, but you don't know why it's a long time. It's because some other thread has done work. And you need to know about that thread and when that thread did a wake up of you. With dynamic tracing, we can trace, and we do this of static tracing for most kernels now, we can do wake up profiling. So who did the wake ups? And then look at the code paths there. And again, the x-axis now is time. How long was the target blocked before we did the wake up? That's great because now you find out if I'm blocked, but I'm blocked on a mutex, now I, can, I may identify who woke me up. So who was holding that lock for a long time. Uh, you can actually associate them together in kernel. Uh, Linux 4.6 comes with an example of this, off wake time, where it associates the off CPU time stack trace with the wake time stack trace in kernel and then sends out the summary. Now, if you really go all the way, you end up with something I've called chain graphs, where you connect all the dots, where at the bottom I've got my off CPU stack, and then I have the first waker stack, then the second waker stack, and so on. So every single thread that woke up another thread that woke up another thread that woke up another thread that finally woke up our blocked thread, we keep adding to the, to the flame graph. I actually print these, these ones in reverse order. So this was SSHD, was blocked in do select, it was woken up by KWorker, which was sending uh, buffers, TTY buffers. That's not very helpful. But if I go to the next waker stack, it was VMstat woke me up by doing a TTY write. This was actually me running VMstat1 over an SSH session. VMstat is writing to its to standard out. The kernel's processing it using KWorker, then it's waking up SSH, SSHD that's reading it. So associating the different uh, levels of wake up. Great because we can use this to analyze all off CPU issues. Although this is very much experimental. This is really pushing dynamic traces to, to the limit to be able to associate all of that in kernel context. Another methodology I want to summarize is latency correlations. With the chain graphs, I'm associating these stack traces in kernel context based on thread ID and conditional variables and all sorts of things programmatically, but you can also correlate different layers in the stack using histograms or heat maps. With this methodology, I measure latency at different stack levels, say disk I.O., file system I.O., syscalls, application requests, and then I compare the histograms. And if I see I have a group of outliers at 167 milliseconds that come from the disks, and they come all the way up into the application, I know they came from the disk. If that group actually came from the file system layer and went up, it would give me a different clue to investigate. Maybe it came from the file system. Maybe it's file system locks. Even better if you can do latency heat maps for each of the layers. 
With latency heat maps, I'm not just visually comparing a histogram, but I have time as well. So I can find, it's much more precise, I might see a quite unique structure here. This has latency on the y-axis and time on the x-axis, and here's my bimodal latency. And sometimes it dips down and that high latency mode gets much faster. Or maybe it's a different uh, type of I.O. altogether. But if I saw that distinct pattern at another layer, I would visually be able to, to associate the two without having to programmatically do it. So latency correlations, histograms if you can, heat maps are even better to quickly associate performance from different layers. Checklists. These are a performance methodology and checklists do work. Uh, even, even though I am a little bit worried about checklists in that checklists obviously have blind spots. They're limited to what's part of the checklist. But uh, I've, I've written one there for Linux performance analysis in 60 seconds. But they do help. And it's something that can be refined and updated over time, shared with other teams where performance analysis of the system is not their expertise, but they can follow a checklist. Checklists have starting and ending points so people can try it and then communicate. I got to the end of the checklist, and everyone knows you've done that. So they do have a, they do have a, a large practical purpose. Uh, and also, if you're an Apollo buff, NASA had lots of checklists with the Apollo program. So Nowadays, we're often not SSHing onto systems, and at Netflix, SSH is the last resort because we have tens of thousands of cloud instances. For cloud analysis, it's usually dashboards. And so checklists are implemented as a dashboard that shows the key metrics that we want to analyze. Even better if the dashboard supports doing different methodologies, like doing use method or workload characterization. Another methodology I'd like to summarize is static performance tuning. So this came from Richard Elling a while ago. And the idea is dynamic performance is when the workload is running, and when the workload is applied. Static performance is the system configuration, and you can measure it when there's no workload, when the system's completely idle. So what commands and tools can you use to check the static state of the system? Like when the disks fill, you can run DF. Often you get into different file system code that has worse performance, so worth checking. What can you see out of maybe it's mega CLI or LSPCI, Numa CTL, and so on and so on, the hardware and software configuration of the system. And once I've got that diagram up, of course, there's another methodology where you just run everything. And I might call that the tools-based method, although this may be an anti-pattern. Uh, but I would keep it in the methodology toolbox as a last resort. If other things have failed to work, then try to run everything. At least, like, tick them off so you don't run them twice. Uh, just as an example there, I've included one I drew for OSX. And so the different tools, some of the different tools you can use for OSX performance analysis. Quite a lot of D-trace ones on that. There are other methodologies as well I haven't covered. So the scientific method, five whys, process of illumination, Intel's top-down methodology, which is a, a great one for, for working your way through CPU cycles, and method R for databases. So what can you do? The most important part about methodologies is to know what's now possible on modern systems. Dynamic tracing means we can efficiently instrument any software. So we're allowed to pose crazy questions because we can probably get them answered now. CPU facilities like performance monitoring counters and model specific registers give us a wealth of information about what the processor is doing at a low level. Uh, and Andy Clean is giving a talk uh, tomorrow, which I'm sure you'll get into some of that exciting stuff. And then visualizations, flame graphs, latency heat maps. These are all great things we can do to answer the questions we want. So ask questions first. You build the methodologies. But you can use methodologies to pose those questions and then find and build the metrics. And also build or buy dashboards to support the methodologies. And so when I talk to... Uh, if, if for, for at Netflix, we build a lot of our own infrastructure monitoring and, and performance analysis tools. If for whatever reason I'm talking to a vendor who wants to sell me an instance analysis or cloud performance analysis tool, then I'll talk them through, I would like to do these methodologies. I would like to do 
the use method. I'd like to do latency analysis. I'd like heat maps of latency at different levels. And that's what I want to see done. So even if you don't build these, knowing that these are reasonable questions to ask of a vendor to build for you is worthwhile. And just to reiterate for dynamic tracing, dy dynamic tracing is amazing. It's also efficient. And I, I've summarized it with this one picture where the old way, let's say I wanted to look at TCP retransmits, the old way would be to use TCP dump to do packet capture of all send receives, drag it all into TCP dump, then write it out to the file system, which may be asynchronously flushed to disks. Then I run an analyzer like Wireshark or Ethereal, reads it, processes it, and then prints out those final TCP retransmits I'm trying to analyze. And so there's CPU overhead to do all of this, there's memory overhead, there's storage, and there's networking to move gigabytes worth of capture files around. The new way is I say, well, I just want that kernel function, just trace it and tell me when it runs and tell me the arguments. And that is a much more lightweight way of monitoring the system or analyzing the system. And also to reiterate, we can measure anything and to show that I've got this slide of the Dtrace tools I wrote for Solaris a while ago. Lots and lots of tools, too many tools, but pretty much anything can be measured. This is now becoming possible in all operating systems. So FreeBSD and OSX have Dtrace. Linux is now getting enhanced BPF, which can do dynamic tracing in the kernel. It can do a lot of these. We'll be, uh, soon to do all of these. Uh, Windows has uh, event tracing for Windows as well. Performance monitoring counters I've mentioned a few times uh, to really show what I mean. I've got a functional diagram, so I like them so much. And again, you can work around it and say, what's the performance of each of these components? Uh, I drew that one from FreeBSD uh, performance monitoring counter groups. Visualizations, uh, latency heat maps, really useful. This example I've got is actually shipped with Linux. It's under samples BPF. Uh, I think that was added in Linux 4.1. And so that's doing disk IO latency as a heat map. And then finally, what you can do is build this into dashboards to make it easy. We're doing that at Netflix. So uh, the use method in Netflix Vector, which is an open source instance analyzing software we've got, you can see the influence of the use method through the default dashboard. So utilization and saturation and error metrics. Although we do have a lot more work to do. So I've decorated this diagram with what's commonly measured and what commonly isn't. And so quite often, tools don't go into the buses. In fact, it means mucking around with PMCs. But that's what should happen. And also for, say, CPU workload characterization, tools commonly don't go into these areas. More PMCs and profiling, but they should. So it's the crystal ball age of performance observability. What questions you want probably can be answered nowadays. And it, it is a different, it requires a different skill set of posing questions of the system rather than just consuming tools. Methodologies are a great way to pose questions. Uh, with, I've been collecting and gathering them and, and using them in practice, but you may also find and develop new ones, which would be excellent. And in my slides, which I'll post online, I've got uh, references for uh, a lot of this material as well. And that's my talk. Thank you. So questions. And then, and then after questions, we have the, we'll have the reception soon. So I'll keep my questions short. Uh, I'm Samir. I work on Go at Google. And one thing I've dealt with, uh, so I, I really liked all the tools you're presenting, and I was firing off emails to people on my team about taking Go's execution traces and re rendering visualizations like this. The challenge I face is that a lot of people, the typical developers, they may not even be aware of these tools, and if they're aware of them, they're not sure how to interpret them or use them. I realize the methodology is part of that. But I wonder whether they can do better to guide people through performance debugging. And I'll make an analogy to uh, debugging web, web rendering performance, which is a much simpler case. There was, you know, Yahoo had why slow, like why is my page slow? So the question was already asked for you. And then it gave you a bunch of, you know, it analyzed your web page and told you what was wrong, what you could fix, 
CSS compression or whatever, right? Um, I'd love to have Y slow for my servers, but I realize it's a more complicated question. I wonder, have you thought about giving the user more guidance in debugging performance issues? Yeah, the question is, have I thought about giving the user more guidance? I've thought about writing a virtual Brendan. <laughs> uh, a long time ago, there was a tool called Virtual Adrian by Adrian Cockroft. Uh, he was my pre predecessor at Netflix. He did performance engineering as well. And when I first heard of it, I didn't like the idea of, of codifying someone's personal performance rules. But then I realized the brilliance in it. He called it Virtual Adrian. He didn't call it Virtual Sun Microsystems Performance Tool. He called it personal, uh, Virtual Person. And people are fallible. And so I think that's actually a good metaphor. I think if I call it, even though I don't, it sounds egotistical, I would actually call it Virtual Brendan. Because <laughs> Brendan's a human, and I can make mistakes. And so if you run it, and it gives you a report, this, is, this report may not be right. But it's, it's a best effort from a person. I'd rather call it that than virtual Netflix performance engineering and have people get angry at performance engineering because it wasn't quite right. So well, one, it's on my to-do list, but uh, netstat minus s. Netstat minus s in Linux, it's getting better all the time. There's so many metrics now. There's over 200 metrics. And people keep coming to my desk saying, Brendan, can you like explain netstat minus s to me? And it's like, OK, I need to write a tool that just takes netstat minus s and then outputs English because there's just too many metrics. It just has to be done. So I, I think the first thing you mentioned, though, was uh, people aren't aware that things can be done. And that's why conferences like this are so important, because I can just go through lots of things. And the most important thing is taking it from and being an unknown unknown to a known unknown. Because once it's a known unknown, and you know that you don't know how to do this, at least it, it's on your to-do list. And when your company really needs it, you then go study it, and it becomes a known known. If it's an unknown unknown, you never get it done. So conference talks especially. But like guidance, and if anyone tries to do guidance, you do have to do a lot of research, because there has been, especially in academia, there's been a lot of work on how to, how to do um, not wizards, but decision tree languages. So you can uh, write basically a, a language for a decision tree that takes the inputs and then spits out the outputs. I have, I have to read a lot of papers before I write the tool, because I know a lot of problems have already been solved. But it'll be a good, good project. Thanks. Hi. Um, my name is Amr, and I'm an application developer. Um, and one idea I'm, I'm trying to work through is, like, I have, I think in terms of code and code changes, code commits, code deltas. And I want to be able to link, in some sort of automated way, code changes to system performance changes. And you know, and this is a matter because uh, application code may be changing a lot. You know, maybe every day, maybe every hour. And these system graphs that you know you are showing us have that you know lots of met nodes and lots of metrics. And I, ultimately, I want to be able to get that back, perhaps, if it is an application code, to like a delta. Yeah. So how, what are you guys doing at Netflix to make that like really easy for the application developer? So the question is, uh, I, I am writing the code. I'm changing the code. Whenever I make changes, I want to know the effect on the system on, the, on my code so that I can then fix my code. So at Netflix, we have uh, rapid deployments. We're doing dozens of deployments every week live in production, and we need to analyze performance quick because the application will change and change and change again. Flame graphs have been great, and so I'll answer the question for CPUs, but you'll see how this works for everything. For CPUs, what we're doing right now is taking flame graphs for when, we, when a developer rolls out new software, it's canary first, so it can spin up a new instance, send a little bit of load to it, and then create a flame graph, and then create a flame graph at the same time of day for the same work load sent to a normal instance. And then you have the two flame graphs in tabs in the browser, and you flick between them, like looking for planet Pluto, and then you see like the tower that grows and shrinks. It's like, that's what I changed. That's the effect of my uh, change. So that's CPU profiling. I have done a little bit of work, and so has, uh, so has uh, Corporal Bez Bezma, and he, he's also published a paper on this about doing differential flame graphs. And that's where you take two profiles, A and B, 
and then you have a, a flame graph that lets you navigate changes in particular and understand them. And so I've done, uh, I'm doing the white-black differentials, but Corpol went and did this three-way differentials. It was pretty cool. I think it's going to work. Um, and I know some people are starting to use those with only just experimenting with them. We don't have more push button yet. So differential flame graphs. What actually should happen is when a developer pushes a change, they get an email back from the build system that says, here's a differential flame graph showing what happened, how your code is using CPUs differently. And it uses color hue or whatever to highlight the differences. Great. So consider CPUs and changing software a solved problem. Now you can extrapolate that to everything else. Because a CPU flame graph, it's simply a collection of stack traces rendered as a hierarchical icicle layer diagram. Those stack traces can be disk IO. So I'm, I'm tracing disk IO requests. They can be TCP IP requests. They can be uh, memory. So for memory, I can do page faults, stack trace, like synchronous stack trace for page faults. So I would walk around the different resources, which is what I will do next, and now, I have experiments. Actually, I am using this for some issues I'm working on now. Um, they're not all push button yet for the Netflix developers, so they ask me to do it on demand. But we should be able to press a button and you get a memory flame graph, memory differential, that shows the different effect on the memory subsystem, whether that's page faults or malloc tracing, the same for disks and the same for networking. So I think that's, that's a direction that um, we can make much better. Yes? Hi, I'm Antoine Grandet. I work at DigitalOcean. Uh, most of what I've learned about this stuff is from reading your material. So I was wondering, uh, like the use method that you promote and stuff like that, did you find them in literature or you invented them? And like, if I want to teach people about these things because I find they're great, uh, would you recommend some like learning path, like read these things to create a foundation or just your a pioneer in this? I don't know. Yeah, the, the, it depends. Things like workload characterization have been around for years and years and years. Uh, the use method I did create, and I created it back when I was teaching systems performance to students, and I was developing my own courseware, and I was creating these awesome performance issues and having my class solve them. And even though I taught them the theory and I taught them the tools, when it came time to sit down and actually solve problems, some people got it and some people didn't. And some people just didn't really have a starting point and were just um, using the streetlight anti-method and all those anti-methods to the tools method, just trying things at random. And so in, in the classroom and as a way to teach other people, I found out codifying the methodologies helped. And so I created the use method for classroom use, but used in the real world lots and lots. Um, a really good resource for the use method is the, uh, on uh, ACMQ. There's an article in ACMQ and CACM on uh, methodologies where I include the use method and other methodologies. Um, I also cover methodologies quite a lot in the Systems Performance book by Prentice Hall. So I went crazy on methodologies and, and, and wrote down all of them that I could uh, document. So I got really excited by it. But um, there, there is actually a good article on Q, which is my first reference just for the use method. So I'll take two more questions, and then we should break for uh, reception. You can ask me questions afterwards. Actually, I think you were first, sir. Um, are you also looking into developing uh, autonomous management tools that is you see I mean uh, identifying performance issues is one thing resolving them is another right one uh, resolve resolving could be manual or automated are you looking into automating some of these uh, performance problems solutions so the question is am I looking into automating do you mean uh, automating solving issues do you mean um, making a say a tuning change um, just to give an example Say you, you're running your server in a, on a, uh, in a virtual machine, yep. and on the hypervisor there aren't any resources, so you identify another hypervisor where you can actually uh, live migrate your virtual machine. An example. Yeah, I mean, it, th those are quite special purpose, uh, and th there's not been much work in automating the tuning of things. There's only one thing that really comes to mind that sort of comes close, and that is, with Netflix, with the cloud, we can deploy on any instance type, and it's all automated. And so there was a project a number of years ago to take workloads and just deploy them on all the instance, different instance types and measure price performance, and then find the instance types with the best price performance, and then just con continue to deploying on that. 
And so you, the workload could move around the different instance types because we could have an application with a thousand instances. So you can imagine a thousand different permutations of tunables and we're testing them with real load. So we can actually measure the price performance and say, that one worked, let's all deploy based on M3.4XLs today and tomorrow it might be something else. So there's been a little bit of work on that. It's pretty interesting, but um, not a lot of work yet. So I think last question, yes. So I have a confession. Uh, I'm an application developer and I rarely think about performance. Okay, now, now I got that off my chest. So my question is, I want to be proactive, I want to do well, but I look at the CPU and I look at the memory and I go, eh, I, looks good. And I don't know until later that, oh, that's a problem and, and in, I need to fix it. What do I do to be more proactive? So the question is, what do I do to be more proactive? One good thing to do is stress testing or squeeze testing, and we do a lot of that at Netflix. That is, we have developers where, uh, we had one developer where their entire application ran on one instance, and they were pretty happy. It's like, no, we're running on a few instances for failover, but they didn't have enough of a workload to really analyze or, or do anything about. But if you take it and you artificially throw lots of load at it so that you can drive CPUs to the, to the maximum limit, you might uncover performance issues before you hit them. And so your to-do list might suddenly get quite full because you realize, well, if we actually, if we actually push workload up, we get um, um killer comes along, we get disk IO, we get all, the, all of these behaviors. So I'd try squeeze testing, and if possible, um, tr try to compare it to alternates. It, it really helps in performance engineering to have a, a gut feeling for where an application should be in terms of requests per second. So if you squeeze test it and it does 19 requests per second, um, you need to be able to know, well, that actually should be 190 requests per second, and, and, and I've obviously got more work to do. So squeeze testing, I think, would be the answer. Um, hopefully, this, okay, so a quick announcement, by the way, some people left things on the 10th floor when they uh, left the 10th floor for here, and so there is a lost and found at the reception where you got your badges this morning downstairs on the ground floor. So if you're missing anything, or you think you might be missing anything, uh, ground floor at the reception. <laughs>